Richard and Dwayne did a fantastic job on that show last year. And yeah. sitting there at like 7.30 Saturday morning, and the line was practically out the hotel door. Welcome back to the Rare Book Cafe, the book lovers' rendezvous. We were gone for a week or so there. Did you miss us? I missed you. Yeah, our producer, Alan, down in Texas, uh, down in Florida. Well, you know what happened to Florida. No electricity. But here we are, my co-host, Lee Lynn, Ridge Books, Calhoun, Georgia. Hello, Lee. Hello, Ed. It's good to be back. I missed everybody. Um, and and I, Lee's co-host. Huh? And, our co and Louise co-host, Richard Morey. My co-host, <laughs> Richard Morey, is with us today, too. <laughs> and uh, and our special guest, who at some point might become a co-host, too. You never know. Uh, John Townsend from Townsend Books. And we're going to be talking today about the upcoming Boston Book Fairs, which sadly I'll miss this year, but several of y'all will be there. Waving the banner for Rare Book Cafe. I'll bring my mug. <laughs> you do that. Well, I'm going to have a half booth. John's <laughs> going to have a booth. Richard, I mean, it's your show. Are you having a booth? Uh oh, I'm not sure I'm on the list. Oh, okay. <laughs> Richard had the entire center of the book fair last year. <laughs> John, tell us a little bit about yourself. Pounds and books. What a play on words. Very cool. Yeah, well, thank you. It's, of course, the play on my last name. And I've, this is my 32nd or 33rd year in the business. Um, I spent 25 years in the corporate world and then had enough of that, moved on to the book world. And I've never looked back. Of course, I've been a lot poorer, but that's all right. Um, <laughs> I am really looking forward to doing but richer this. in mind and spirit. Of course. Absolutely. Anyway, I've done a lot of book fairs throughout the country. Uh, I think the furthest I've ever traveled is uh, to Den the Denver Book Fair. Actually, Rich and I met several times out there when I with we both have a mutual friend in in the Denver area, and uh, and 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 participant. In fact, for a couple of years, I was a participant, a lecturer, part of the Colorado Antiquarians Books book seminar that was there in Colorado Springs. And of course, now it's moved to Minneapolis. I think it's I Minneapolis. 2016 graduate. Yeah. I was there in 07. Were you? Okay. I can't remember what year I was, but it was when it was the first year, the last year that the gentleman that ran A.B. Bookman uh yeah. oh i remember yeah. his name um that was it zach or something like that no no oh god we'll look I, it up i yeah. i was there in 97 so wow. and i think his last year was 98 or 99 yeah. maybe that would have been when i was there anyway i've done a lot of book fairs bouncing all around who include um the, the show in west um in in uh, saint pete did that two or three times and richard you and i met down there for dinner we we too. did yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and of course i saw you last year when i was a book buyer, just being a buyer a, a purchaser and came by the show that you and Dwayne managed uh there in the boston area in the hotel well the hilton hotel and you know i was so doggone impressed with the job that you and Dwayne did to create that one and because of the work that i knew you were going to be doing for this one i said i've got to sign up for it you know the 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 crowd that was there uh was well I kept bumping into people all over the place, whether I was trying to get into a booth or trying to vacate one and get to the next one. 
uh, it was fabulous and everybody was buying, everybody had stuff under their arms or bags in their hands. And, and I, I was just so impressed. I said, I've got to get to this show. And fortunately, and here you it. are. There you and are. Here I am. I'll be there. Richard and Dwayne did a fantastic job on that show last year. And yeah. sitting there at like 7.30 Saturday morning, and the line was practically out the hotel door, you know, of people waiting to get in. I had never quite been in one that was quite so that. I, 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 wait, know. here's a sign of a good show. 7.30 in the morning. Were there donuts? Uh I think, and were there donuts, Richard? Were there no, donuts? No, no, but ac actually there may be this year. Uh, All right. We're going upscale. Uh, yeah, so, so, John, sure. what are you bringing to the show? I guess, uh, you know, you're, you're a uh, mostly sell online and uh, by appointment only, right? Yeah, that's true. Um, you know, I've got some doggone many things here that are special. Uh, I hope I'm not showing too many, but... This first one is quite unique. I'm sure that you've all heard about the Roger Torrey Peterson and right. his field guide to the birds. Well, this is the first one that he ever produced, 1934. This is not only a first edition, but it's a first state first edition. Extremely scarce because there's a goofy little error in it that was corrected with the next issue. And um, this thing is is phenomenally scarce. I've I've got a price on it to commemorate that that scarcity. It looks it, brand new. So so, so John right shape. John, isn't yeah. there a back a backstory to that first edition? Uh, correct me you correct me if I'm wrong, but my rec recall on that book is that <clears throat> along with several other famous authors like Beatrix Potter, um, he had to actually self-publish that because when he went to the publishing companies, they said, oh, we have Audubons. Why do we need what? Who, who are you, Peterson? <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and he had actually self-published his the first. No, I have to disagree with you on that, Richard. Okay. All right. Um, it was published by Houghton Mifflin. Yeah. And the only backstory I can think of is Houghton Mifflin didn't think that it would sell well because of the other field guides that were around. Uh, I'm actually going to be bringing another very early field guide by another author. And, and so they only published... I think it was 500 in the first run. Okay. And to show their display and, you know, their, their lack of excitement about that. But I think in the same week that it started selling because the books that they put out to various venues sold immediately. And they, in that same week, they started, Oh, we got to get back and, print out some more or print, you know, uh, bind some more and get them out there. They realized they made a mistake. With and, and so that's the only backstory. Okay. I think of. Well, no, I don't mind being corrected and like to have it the story <laughs> straight. The next I was... thing I want to talk about is, and this one, I'll better take it out of the envelope, but put it down because it is mighty damn scarce. Of course, I still have a piece of last scene on it okay um the life of venture this is a reprint i don't know if that's showing up at all but this is a reprint of the original slave narrative that this gentleman wrote in 1798 and um, what I'm seeing on my own video is pretty small. So yeah. anyway, this is what we believe to be the first slave narrative ever published in the United States. And I'm sure it is perhaps the first and only slave narrative printed here in Connecticut, because this was produced in New London initially, New London, Connecticut. And... Mm -hmm. And this is a reprint of 1897, 
with an addendum in it that is probably seven or eight pages long where the contributor of that addendum was interviewing people that knew Venture Smith. The man was immensely strong. He weighed around 300 pounds. He was between 6'2 and 6'3. And believe it or not, he had a waistline of six feet. He There's an anecdote in the book about him pushing one of the boats that he loaned alone to two gentlemen who went down to the river here than Connecticut River, just, you know, a half mile from me. He went, the two gentlemen that were running the boat went down to the beach on the river and were unable to move it into the river. It was sort of in the sandbank. They went up to uh, his house, which was close by. Venture said to them, look, you know that I've lost my vision because he was quite elderly at that point. He died at the age of 78 or nine, I can't remember. And if you guys just lead me down to the boat, don't worry, I'll get it in the water for you. So they led him by the hand down to the boat, brought him up to the bow of the vessel. He puts his hands on it. And the the narrator of this little anecdote said they could feel or the, the boat could feel the strength that he was already applying to the boat. And he pushed it into the Connecticut River. The men jumped on it and off they went. But he... He was just incredible. He, uh, when he, at the elderly age, when he had lost his vision, he was still buying and selling oxen. And to get a handle on just how much they weighed, he'd walk up behind the oxen, pick up its hind legs, and lift it in order to determine its weight. Wow. This guy would, during his younger years, would would cut seven cords of wood a day. And if any of you have ever attempted to cut one cord of wood in a day with an ax, it, it's a remarkable feat. So this guy was really What a really story, what a story. Yeah. Great Another piece. thing that I've got is I, I recently heard on the ABAA discussion site talk about books without words. And I have one here. It's a book by Lind Ward. The whole thing is just nothing but pictures. Of course, the title it is the title page is printed, but the rest of it is all woodblock illustrations. And that's typical of what's in the book and it goes like that throughout the entirety of the book it tells a story with all of these these images and very unique um i had never seen one until i happened to come up with that so that'll be there i've got another one here which a lot of people are aware of more recently because this book has become very popular Sailing around, Alone Around the World. This is a gem of a copy. Uh, I just couldn't believe it when I got it. And um, it's a first edition. It's it's extremely uh, popular to anybody in the nautical world. I know that Greg Gibson has had it a number of times. And and it never seems to, to hang around on anybody's shelf for very long. So... Another one, now this one is really kind of unique because it's a good example of what collectors can often do with the, the books that they really value. And this is The House of Seven Gables by Hawthorne. But it's in a slip, I mean, a, a, a clamshell box, and it houses two first edition copies of the one volume of House of Seven Gables. They're almost identical. The only thing different in the two is that 
the this one copy has the uh, publisher's catalog dated at the same time as the book was released. And my mother isn't good enough to be able to repeat what that is, but it was at March of 1862. Let's see if I'm anywhere right on that. Uh, missed it by a decade, 1852. Oh, this is July of 1852. So the other one, again, identical, nearly identical. This one is dated March of 1851. I wasn't too far off. Anyway, very unique. I would not be at all surprised if a dealer didn't buy this and say, hell, I'll throw away the clamshell box and sell each of these for seven or eight hundred dollars each, and he will have made a profit. Um let me know if I'm pushing last the one. Envelope. Last one, one, pick us a good one. All right. This is unique as heck. The pop-up Pinocchio. Uh -huh. uh, I don't really specialize in children's books at all. But when I saw this, I said, that is quite unique. I've never Richard's seen Richard's going to make you an offer for that. <laughs> I'm sorry? Well, <laughs> Richard's going to make you an offer for that. Okay. And, and, he loves pop-up books. Actually, and I had that running through my mind. <laughs> <laughs> it got a very unique front-end sheet. And illustrations through it are throughout but then there are these pop-ups that appear there are i think six or eight of them i can't remember how many but the but in many of them that are online there's something wrong with the pop-up and in most cases it is dealing with the last one which is a giant fish is coming up out of the water and has swallowed pinocchio and if you can see it there, and if I can get my hand out of the way, Pinocchio is in the mouth of that giant fish that looks more like a, a tuna than a whale. But <laughs> it, what do you what do you have that price at, John? Uh the price is two hundred twenty-five. I'll buy it. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm gonna bring it instead okay. of sending it to you. <laughs> no, please do, but put my name on it. Okay. Uh -huh. I'll Thank take you. the referral commission. <laughs> you get no commission. <laughs> <laughs> I was right, it was a pleasure to have you today. It's so fun uh, just being around book dealers who know the backstories, who know who know the books inside out, and and, and that's what makes book fair so fun. And that's why people come, right, Lee? Because right. I want to talk to the experts. Right. You can't talk to an expert on ABE books. Well, you can't talk to an expert, yeah, by text either very well. <laughs> All right, Rich, I'm going to tell you that I've got your name on this yellow sticky. So okay. It'll Sounds be good. Sounds good. All right. Do I sign yeah. off or what? Yeah, we're going to say goodbye. Adios, amigos. Thank okay, you. everybody, thanks for coming on back to the Rare Book Cafe. You can find us every week on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and wherever good podcasts are giving away to free. <laughs> giving away for free. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, I'm not going to get my lips back in shape. Bye bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye bye. Bye. bye.